welcome to The Family of Things, a podcast series about ideas, life and how we live it. I'm Helen Shaw and my guest this episode is a man with his eyes firmly fixed on the skies. It's Professor Peter Gallagher. He's a scientist, a solar physicist who is, as he says himself, a little bit obsessed with the sun. I mean, his research is at the cutting edge of science and at the heart of understanding our universe. But Peter, I mean, welcome. But first of all, how did it all begin? I mean, I know you grew up in Dublin on the north side, but was your house full of science? Were your parents scientists? How did you get involved? How did you get interested in science? God, my childhood was very average and normal. And uh, I spent a lot of time jumping over walls, stealing apples from people's orchards, playing football, um, a lot of outdoors, climbing trees, building tree houses, that kind of thing. So very free uh, kind of childhood. But my parents were very ambitious for the kids, my, me and my brother and my sister, uh, to do well at school. And neither my father nor my mother had a leaving cert. So both left school at about 16. But they had that ambition that, that we would go on to college. My mother always said, do what you love, in fact. So I think if I'd wanted to be a road sweep or a painter or a musician, uh, my parents would have supported me doing something that I loved. So I think that's what the vibe always was. Do what you love and do it well, I guess. And what could you into science then? I mean, often we think about people having great science teachers. What turned you on to science? Uh, There was a programme on BBC called Tomorrow's World, which I just loved as a kid. I would always watch it. And it was kind of adult stuff for a 10 year old. But I just loved that. My dad was a fitter, a service engineer for a company. So he went around fixing compressors around the country. He used to bring me to to factories, which he probably shouldn't in, in modern days. But, you know, we would take apart compressors together. So I know where the spark plug is, I know exactly where the cylinder head is, I know where the um, piston is and the, the piston rings and I know where the crankshaft is and I know what they are and I took them apart and I'd be covered in oil and I was 10, 11 years old and I absolutely loved doing that kind of thing. But I remember he would have manuals and I would spend ages looking at these manuals with technical drawings on them, thinking how beautiful these drawings are and I wanted to do those kind of things. So. I guess dad had set me on that path of kind of engineering and wondering how things work. And I was fascinated by the way things work. So we had an old TV and the big old TVs were big, heavy things. And I took it apart and I remember taking it apart and trying to work out what the hell's inside this. What's that thing? Oh, it's a capacitor. What's that thing? It's a resistor. What's that thing? That's the power supply. And I always wanted to know how things work. So there was that curiosity that was just in me. And I also loved building things as well. So, you know, building tree houses, I always built tree houses. I built good tree houses and I would always have my friends together and we'd all build tree houses. We'd have nails and hammers and I'd take all my dad's tools and we'd be sawing down the back lane, building tree houses and stuff. So there was always that what I would call very creative streak in trying to build new things and, and learn about the way things work and, and so on. So there was a curiosity that was always there, I I think. But my parents fed it as well. So my parents copped on to this and then they got me a chemistry set. Now, it sounds like I was really into my science, but I wasn't doing very well at school at the time. I was... um, wasn't great at concentrating at school. Um, I would look out the window an awful lot. I much rather having fun with my friends at the back of the class talking and causing trouble than being involved in the straight A student in the front of the class. So I was very mediocre, I think, in school. There was times where I'd get A's and people would go, hold on a sec, how the hell did you get an A? Uh, But then the most most of the time it was kind of straight, normal. And uh, So school, I didn't stand out at all at school, but the longer I stayed in college, the better I got. And I guess, Peter, what made you look upwards sky wise and think about the stars, the planets and in a sense, the world that you moved into as a student and as a scientist? I I think my curiosity was always just there. I wanted to know why water goes downhill. (laughs) I wanted to know that. I always looked at the tap when I was a kid and put my finger over the tap. And when you put your thumb over the tap, the water goes quicker and squirts out. And then when you take your finger away, it goes slower. And I was always like, I don't understand why that is. And I didn't have the mathematics to understand that. And I always wanted to know how the lights worked. And I always wanted to know why the grass was green and why the sky is blue and why the stars shine. So to me, 
everything is part of the one question. How does it work? And even in front of me here, there's a glass of water. Well, what's the water made out of? It's made out of hydrogen and oxygen. And the, the hydrogen all comes from the Big Bang. So I want to know where that water comes from. And then all of the oxygen in that glass, it sounds like I'm making it up. It's true, though. It comes from stars. It's made inside stars. So something from the Big Bang and something made inside its stars ends up being on our planet and I'm now drinking it and it's crucial to our life. But one of the things you did ask me is how did I get into the stars? And there was, when I was about 16, I started <laughs> zig and zag on RTE TV, had a guy called uh, David Moore from Astronomy Ireland on talking about astronomy. And I began to think, wow, he actually knows the way stars work. And I was always into Star Wars and so on, like lots of kids are. But that began to turn me on a little bit and I started going to a couple of public lectures when I was about 16 but the real thing that got me into the stars was Stephen Hawking's book A Brief History of Time I read that and I thought wow the enlightenment you know it's kind of a moment of enlightenment and I thought that's phenomenal he knows how black holes work I want to understand that because there is always that thing about like that we're meant to do things or the idea that somebody's born to do something but it's kind of interesting in that that there's a randomness about it you were in a sense, it sounds like an engineer by yeah. instinct, making, creating and inventing and, and tweaking and playing with things. But in a sense, the whole world of physics almost becomes something that wasn't there in the Leaving Cert. You could have easily gone into another field completely. Now, my Leaving Cert, I have to say, wasn't good because of music. I had a band when I was 17 and 18 years old, and this drove my parents mad. All that they would hear from my bedroom was not my brain crunching over trying to get my honours Irish right. It was um, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, Sex Pistols, Led Zeppelin, and me trying to perfect the guitar solos in every single one. And so we had a band called Indestroy, and it was a, a group of uh, guys from the road. We kind of played punk and heavy metal uh, music. And I spent my time trying to get a gig and to get uh, a demo and to get a, a, a band going. So that was my project. And, and I still play guitar, but that was the thing that I was going for at the time. Now, I still listen to all that music and I still play it. In fact, this morning I was playing Guns N' Roses with my nine-year-old son. So it's still there. Because uh, you mean you grew up north side Dublin, yeah. and as you say, parents not scientists in rock and roll, and a good but maybe not mind blowing leaving cert. No, I mean, you could have gone lots of different ways by the time you left. At what was it? No, 18? And I, I must say the school I went to. I went to a Christian brother's school called um, O'Connell's on the North Circular Road, and it had a great tradition of taking kids from working class areas from around Dublin One, and really helping them to make that transition into college. So lots of the students that I was in school with ended up going to UCD, for example, on scholarships or, or, or so on. But it wasn't the elite academic school at all. It was a school of hard knocks. There was um, tough kids who ended up in Mount Joy. There was drugs in the area. There was always threats of being beaten up, going to school, coming home from school. It was a very tough environment. Uh, and it's funny, looking back on it, I look back on it fondly in many ways. But there were some gems of teachers in there who nurtured those of us who showed a little bit of talent or, or ambition. And uh, there was a number of teachers who really said, that guy wants to do honours maths. I'm going to help him do honours maths. And there was one guy, Dr. Murphy, who brought us through, a group of us, and he really helped us. Um, and I got my honours maths in my leaving cert because he helped the guys with the long hair and the spandex to get through it. So after school, where'd you go? Where was college? And as you say, reading Hawkins opened you to that world of physics. But what was happening at university? In my CAO, I wasn't sure. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be a scientist. I wanted to be an architect. They were all there. But I got into UCD, into science, and I did chemistry and physics and biology and mathematics because I wanted to keep myself broad. And I met my wife in the first term. And, Emma Teeling. Uh, Emma Teeling, yeah. I met my wife and that was uh, the most successful part of my career at college. No, it was wonderful. We had a great time at college. Um, and then there was the science as well. So you're sitting in a lecture theatre and you've got a person in front of you who is English or German or American, who's been around the world, who is the top of their area in science, talking to you about what they're passionate about. And I was very engaged in that. I just, I loved it, loved it. Now, I do remember being completely lost at times and thinking, I can't keep up with this. But 
you'd go away at the weekend and you'd catch up in your lectures and stuff. But I found it extremely stimulating. And that's when my mind changed. I was like, I'm going to be a scientist. That's it. I want to do this. And I suppose then the leap from being a scientist to focusing in physics and then solar physics. What was that journey? I mean, both you and Emma end up in Queens and Belfast. Yeah, well, in, in UCD, they gave us a great training where they put us in the labs in third and fourth year and they basically say, turn out the lights when you're going home. So they gave us equipment. Most of it was broken or we suspected that they broke it on purpose on it. We had to put it all together and do our, our experiments. But what we learned was to work together to problem solve, to not have your hand held. But if it's broken, find some sellotape, find a stick, find a soldering iron and put them all together and get the equipment to work. And that was great training in UCD. And uh, that has stood to me. That's what I do now, that, that kind of skill that I picked up there. But Queen's in Belfast, they had scholarships for students from the south at the time. And so I went up to Belfast to do um, up to electronics, actually. But they made a mistake. I got top of the class. You see, this is where I was kind of middle of the class as a primary school student. Then I went, I'm in a master's in Queens and I got top of the class. And by becoming top of the class, they sent me to the Canary Islands to work on optics on telescopes. And you don't give somebody who has a minor interest in astronomy a big telescope and lots of data because... I began to see the optics and go, oh, I'm not interested in that anymore. I want to understand how the galaxy works. I want to understand how the stars work. And that was a point where I said, I can't do this part time anymore. I can't be a weekend astronomer anymore. This is the only thing that keeps me awake at night. And I talk about that a lot. Things do keep me awake at night. And that's when you're really passionate about it. Are you awake at night thinking about your subject? And that's the way when I stop doing that, that's when I have to stop being a scientist if I'm not awake at night. So that was the point where I just said I have to be a professional in that. And a, a PhD came up in Queens to work with NASA. So if I continued on at Queens, did this PhD, I get to spend time at NASA. And, you know, this is the Vatican for astrophysics is to go and work at NASA. So I was on a plane to NASA all of a sudden and uh, working at Goddard Space Flight Center in my summers, operating satellites, taking data down, uh, looking at pictures of the sun in rooms full of scientists saying things like CDS is nominal, SOHO is nominal, downlink facility turned on, you know, this kind of thing. And I'd be sitting there with a grin from the left to the right of my face. And uh, I ended up working there then as a scientist and uh, ended up being, a, being there up until, well, actually it's 10 years ago now. And I guess what's curious about this journey and that period is that as you move into that area and end up in NASA and Goddard, how many Irish people are in that sphere in research in space? Well, once you go to NASA, there's very few. There's 10,000 people on base. There was uh, engineers who were working on the shuttle. You'd go down into another room and there'd be astronauts being trained and uh, you'd see the astronauts at lunchtime. I always remember one guy were sitting having lunch. Bill Mather was his name. And uh, he leaves. He's a lovely man, six foot four. And uh, very nice, understated. And somebody nudges me and said, he's going to win the Nobel Prize. And he did. He won the Nobel Prize two years later for building a satellite called COBE, uh, which looked at the Big Bang. And he's, it's a famous map of all these blobs in space that were left over after the Big Bang. And he won that. But, you know, that's the table you're having your lunch with. And, and that uh, is literally mind blowing. And you never get over the excitement of being with people like that. But there was a few Irish people around, but not, not very many of us. But it's interesting now where I am, I'm back in Trinity and I have a big group of Irish people who are now all making that same journey over to NASA to do what I did. And I think it's opened up a whole world of opportunity for Irish students and Irish scientists. I met Emma in UCD, obviously, as science students. Yes. And when you roll back the clock to then, it must be incredible to think as students then, where you both are now leading in separate fields to international research areas, because Emma obviously is a leading geneticist in UCD. Yeah. Predominantly using research around bat colonies. Yeah. For 
genome research. So uh, we, we met in, in first science in UCD and uh, I remember Emma saying to me that she wanted to do a PhD in science. And I thought to myself, what the hell is a PhD? I didn't know what a PhD was, which just tells you an awful lot of where I was coming from. Um, I was the first person in my family going to one of the universities. Emma's father had a PhD from Harvard. Emma's mother had, I think, two master's degrees and was doing a PhD in UCD at the time. So she was very much from an academic family. But we connected immediately. She was passionate about science. I was passionate about science. She was great crack. I was great crack as well, I think. Well, she was she was particularly great crack. She never stopped talking and uh, was just a fascinating person. I was captivated by her. And uh, we have that kind of best friend passion for science. But uh, the journey with Emma was long and it had its ups and downs because I went to Belfast. She went to Edinburgh. I went to New Jersey for a little while. She went to California for a little while. Then I went to California. Then we both went to Washington, D.C. together. Then she got a job in UCD. Then I followed her back to UCD. So there was eight years, really, of, you know, hobo scientists trying to keep a relationship together and keep their science going. And it was it was challenging. It was really hard. It was it was not an easy thing to do. But when I look back on it, it was the most exciting part of my life, you know, I was in Japan during an earthquake at a science conference. I saw a total solar eclipse in the Caribbean. We were operating equipment there. I worked at 8,000 feet at the top of a mountain in, in New Mexico. And there was no mobile phones. It's funny, we'd be on emails to each other going back and forth. So she came to visit me. I'd go and visit her. And we spent a lot of time in the air trying to get to one another to keep things going. And Peter, just to get back to, I suppose, those turning points, because I'm really curious about the roads that we go on and where it leads us to, because you're in NASA, you're meeting with people who end up winning the Nobel. You're at that level. And in some ways, was a whole world exploding for you then? Yeah, it was. We were at that turning point. You know, um, I'd been offered a very good job at NASA running a, a very large spacecraft. I was at a point where I could really make a difference and do something very interesting in NASA. But I'm unfortunate that I'm passionate about Ireland as well. And I wanted to spend my career working in Ireland. I always had that dream that I'd go to these places, I'd learn at the highest level and I'd come back to Ireland and then I'd do it there and I'd open it up here. So I always felt, why would I spend the next 30 years of my life working for NASA with no benefit for Ireland or Irish students? So when I came to that point, there was an opportunity to come back to Ireland. Now, my opportunity wasn't fabulous, but there was an opportunity. And I thought I can come back to Ireland and still use my NASA links. I can go there every summer. Um, I have access to the data that's coming in. I have that network of people that I still work with today. So we came home to Ireland, took huge pay cuts, walked away from some of the the big opportunities over there. And uh, Emma did exactly the same. And we started building research groups, so groups of people who would work on those scientific questions that NASA are working on. And that's where I am today. And I think it was the right decision. In fact, I think it was a better decision. I think I had more flexibility in Ireland. I think I've had more flexibility in the universities. I've had access to brilliant minds from the students coming up through Trinity. And discoveries are made by brilliant minds. Actually, brilliant and curious are, brilliance is often confused in in many ways. You can have straight A's in your leaving cert. You can come first class honours through your degree. But unless you're curious, you won't make the discoveries. And there's a curiosity that when I'm picking people to come and work in my research groups, I may have somebody who has a B or even C class students. But if I see that they're passionate and curious and hardworking, they might end up being better than the first class honours student. The first class is not what we're looking for. It's the creative, it's the curious. That's really the key things to making the discoveries. And Peter, when you came back to Trinity and began the research team where you are now, what was your sense about Ireland's story in astronomy, in space and in your case, solar research? I knew that we had we had Boyle, we had Kelvin, we had the Earl of Ross, we had Stokes all these brilliant scientists of the past that we 
talked about a little bit, but didn't really feature in modern contemporary culture in the way that Shaw did or the way that Yeats did or the way that those cultural icons stand up in Irish society. The electron was named by an Irish person. The quark came from James Joyce. All of these things began to come together in my mind and I thought, OK, I would like to be part of that. Now, I must say, coming to Ireland at that time was a time when the Irish government was investing in science. And so we had the formation of Science Foundation Ireland. So for a lot of us abroad, we saw Science Foundation Ireland emerging as this new body that was going to fund basic research on all kinds of things from astrophysics, information technology, biotechnology. I'm sorry to see that that balance has changed in the way our government is, is now funding science. And I think it needs to swing back to look at the more curiosity driven research. And I think Ireland is missing a trick there. So fundamental research, the idea that Einstein might be allowed to go into a room or a potential future Einstein and think about ideas rather than what's the business plan that you're working on for a product. Yeah, absolutely. And now I, I also I worry about universities and that's not just Irish universities, Irish universities, UK universities, this business model to the university. I, I think university professors and postdocs and researchers need time to think. You need to have that space where it's not a luxury, it's a requirement that you have two hours in the morning or two hours in the afternoon to read papers and think about the consequences of those papers. And it's a time to think and a time to write. And I find that has been pushed out of what a modern academic does. There's a rush to publish, there's a rush to build large research groups, there's a rush to bring in research income. So suppose, what year did you come back to Trinity? 2005, I think we came back. So I'm basically 10 years, just 10 years in Ireland. So if you take this 10 year period, can you give us a sense of the impact of that and how you might see Ireland now participating in research? Wow, it's been hugely exciting. Um, So my research group is a name internationally now, you know. They know the research that we do because we're publishing papers at the level that I would expect somebody at NASA to be publishing. So we're really part of the international research community. And then when I bring in a research student, they get connected into that network of people and they get to play with the biggest players in the world. In terms of the science that we do, we look at the sun. So why do we want to understand the sun? Well, we want to understand these things called solar flares. They're small explosions on the sun. And actually, they're not that small. They're, they're enormous, in fact. They're small by the size of the sun, but they're enormous by the size of us. These explosions happen on the sun. We want to know why they happen on the sun. What is it about the magnetic fields and sunspots that causes them to produce explosions that send radiation into space? And then you say, OK, fine, that sounds like exotic physics, but those electrons and protons and radiation from the sun, if you're an astronaut in space, you can be affected by that. You could be killed by one of those if you're on your way to Mars. And going to Mars isn't that long away. It may happen in our lifetime. In fact, we're always sending spacecraft to Mars, but I think humans will go to Mars in the coming decades. So how do we protect them? One of the things we've got to do is we've got to predict when solar flares are going to happen. Then our mobile phones, our GPS systems, our communication systems, Uh, When you're flying transatlantic, when you're flying anywhere, your plane has a navigation system and a communication system that is all vulnerable to these solar flares. Solar flares can knock out some of these communication systems. So that's what we do. We try and make the space weather more accurate. So like Met Aaron does weather forecasting, we do the space weather forecasting. And the nature of being in a teaching research environment is that you now over 10 years, you have a legacy of postdoctoral scientists who well, come uh, from this, who are going all around the world. Well, it's interesting. There was one who was in Hawaii for a while. There's one in California for a while. Uh, there's one in Washington, D.C. There's one in Belgium. And they're in very diverse careers. Some of them are research scientists. There's people who've gone out into Paddy Power. They've got data coming in very quickly and they want to make decisions on where the data is going. So that's what we do. We have data coming in from the sun and the trend is going up or the trend is going down or it's fluctuating. We characterise that stuff. Then obviously there's people working in stock markets Um, and then there's teachers. Uh, So it sounds exotic and weird, but it's not. It's just there's lots of skills in there that are very transferable and so important to industry and and that link between that blue skies research and that industry is key to that creative process it's a pipeline to me and it's a pipeline that needs a start in basic research and an end in industry and we work together Now, 
obviously your work is predominantly research around the sun, but we're also tied into the fact that in this time period, there's been a growth in other areas of Irish research in space. Science in Ireland from the foundation of the state up until almost the year 2000 was done very much on a part-time basis in the universities. It wasn't done at a real international level. Now, there was certain scientists who were world-class, but it was quite sleepy in many ways for a long period from the foundation of the state. But since about the year 2000, I think, there's been more funding coming into the system and there's groups emerging, really good groups in Galway and Cork and Trinity. And in total, there's probably 100 researchers on the island doing astronomical research. And it, it's not just the astronomical research. It's also there's actually companies working there as well. So there's about 40 companies in Ireland all working with the European Space Agency and uh, Irish companies are, are winning contracts from it. And they're not just doing astrophysics. They're looking at... Um, deforestation using uh, remote sensing. They're looking at algae blooms out on the coast. They're tracking ships that shouldn't be coming into Irish coastal waters for defence purposes. That's all coming from space-based satellites that are feeding that information. So it's very much real-world applications based on what is done in space. But somebody has to know how to build the satellites and launch them. And that's where the space scientists play that important role. You've mentioned Hawking's book being seminal to you in terms of opening the door and thinking about the galaxy, the Big Bang, astrophysics. There is also a second story around that. Yes, that was interesting. So it came full circle. Um, I do a lot of reviewing of proposals internationally. So the UK funding agencies will ask me to come and review proposals or the European Space Agency or NASA or whatever agency. And they get a group of scientists together and we look at proposals. But I received this big brown envelope with all the proposals in it, opened it up and there's Stephen Hawking's proposal on the very top of it. So I had to review his proposal. He wanted to build a supercomputer for five or ten million pounds to understand black holes and the physics going on around black holes. And... um, I was very nervous because we then have to interview the scientists. So I'm 35 years old, maybe at this stage, and we're sitting on a panel and in comes Stephen Hawking in his chair. And uh, we start probing him, literally. What do you mean by this, Professor Hawking? Do you really think that this computer can achieve this? I don't believe that this can work on the boundary of a black hole. Uh, Can you explain that in better detail? Do you think that algorithm can actually tell you about the physics in such an extreme environment? So this kind of thing. So it was an amazing experience to be on the other side of Stephen Hawking, but really connecting to him. Did he get the funding? No comment. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I suppose the the reason it's worth mentioning is one, he did open a door for you. Hugely. From your perspective, meeting him or engaging with him, was it as often it can be when we meet our heroes different? No, no. He, I mean, he, he lived up to the expectation. He exceeded the expectation. He He has a profound insight into something that's very exotic. He sees the physics of the environment around black holes. He understands those things. And his insight is unique in the world. And when I met him, it was still there. He's not just a star, (laughs) if I can use that word. That's not what he is. He's a profound thinking scientist. I suppose what connects Stephen Hawking and yourself beyond those stories is that both of you believe passionately in communicating your science, in bringing the rest of us struggling into the field of understanding that territory. Why do you think that's important? I mean, as a scientist, you spend a considerable amount of time communicating your work, your passion for it, your curiosity, but also, in a sense, the need for the public engagement with that field. I think there's a fascinating story that people don't appreciate at times. Science is part of what makes us human beings in the same way that art or great literature is part of our makeup and their ways of us expressing what it means to be a human being. And that's what science is to me. It's part of that continuum of the human quest to understand and contextualize the world around us and our place in that world. And I think part of that story is missing, which is our science. And I want to try and get people to think about that. People think that science is hard 
and it, it is hard, but the concepts are equally as accessible as the great poetry or the great literature. I also feel that the opportunity in science for students is wonderful. And I don't like going to the Dublin Four schools as much as I like going to the Dublin One schools or the schools in the Midlands or in other parts of Ireland that don't get scientists regularly. I want to get out to those schools and have a kid going, that guy sounds like me or that girl sounds like me. They came from a similar background to me. I can actually work at NASA. How the hell did he get to NASA? He doesn't sound that brilliant. I think I can be as good as him. So I want to get out there and, and tell kids about that and say, this is how I did it. You can also do it and uh, follow your dream. Don't just aim for whatever that job is. Do what you really dream about and you'll be good with it and you'll get the opportunities. So I, I feel that's important as well. It's not just engaging people in it. It's, it's also saying that there is a world out there that you can play a part in. And maybe it's just worth asking on that as well. As you say, you come from North Dublin, a family that not particularly wealthy, probably lower middle class, you would say, and in a sense, not immediately destined to be the NASA scientist or to be leading over the last 10 years a new field in this. So the question I'm kind of always curious about in that is when you think about the confidence to become that person or be that person, do you have a sense about what gave you the confidence or the wherewithal to follow that dream? That's uh, difficult. Um, confidence. Emma. <laughs> <laughs> no, she was. She the confidence was always there. Um, I am the person that sees something that I want to achieve, and I'm afraid that nobody's getting in my way. <laughs> So when I was in the rock band, I wanted to get on that stage and we were going to get on that stage. We were awful. We were absolutely awful. And even when we got to the stage, we were even worse when we were on stage. But by God, we got there. So there was kind of a thing. And the more people say no, the more I say not in your life. Uh, I'm going forward with this. So there was always that drive to keep on going. And if they said no, I'd disengage with them and I'd go around them. I don't let the barrier get in my way. And, and I think that's the point. And I wouldn't call myself a confident person, but I want to get somewhere. So I have to get there, irrespective of whatever my failings are. I guess one of the things I've heard you say a lot when I see you do talks is that when we were in the Walton Theatre in Trinity, you bring out the cloak because you often reference the fact that a Nobel Prize is there for Ireland. Like, obviously, we have had awards in Nobel Prizes in science, one quite recently. But for you in science, in your field, you're, you're continually putting it out there. Not so much maybe that it could be you, but also that, that it's there for the person with that sense of will. Yeah. Yes, I'm the proud um, custodian at the moment of Ernest Walton's gown. This is the gown he wore in Cambridge. And I bring it out and I show the undergraduates this. And after some of my lectures on atomic physics to third years, I'll bring out the gown and I say, look, this is the gown of a Nobel Prize winner who was a student in this very lecture theatre. So students get that. They see that, God, he was born in Waterford, came to Trinity. I was born somewhere in Ireland. I came to Trinity Maybe I'm on that trajectory. And I think that seed is something that we should have in our kids. And our kids should have that quest to be there. It's not something that others do. It's something that we do. Now, I should say whether or not I'll win the Nobel Prize is a long shot. Uh, but, you know, here's to hoping. Because I think that's really important that you put that out there. Like we come from a country where whatever way sometimes we describe it, we usually will put that down if people have strong, ambitious statements. So in a sense, the courage, but also the will to put it out there and as a sense of saying, I want to win the Nobel Prize. I can and could win it. It's a matter of the work that you put into it. Do you think the States gave you that courage to sort of say, yeah, of course, if you're a good scientist, you can win the Nobel. That's, that's, that's the deal. <laughs> well, that's what I love about America. I love the can-do attitude. Um, um, and I, We don't or haven't in the past had the can-do attitude. But I think things have changed in Ireland. You know, we had the financial crash. There was overconfidence. There was arrogance about the way Irish strided around thinking that we'd created all of this. And, and that was a bad thing. And I hope that we've learned from that 
excess brashness that was unwarranted. And science and being an athlete and being a great writer and being great at business is not about arrogance. Arrogance is a flaw as far as I can see. But confidence is an extremely important thing to have in any of those. And I think that I'm seeing people being more confident in what we do. And when we go out internationally, we are confident. Now, I do see students coming into Trinity and you would expect them to be confident, but there still is that Irish quietness. We say that Irish people are talkative and brash and so on. I think we actually can be quite quiet and shy in engaging and putting our ideas out there. So one thing that we try and do in Trinity is with the first years, draw them out of themselves. Can you please stop me while I'm teaching and say, I don't understand that. Just in terms of, of coming full circle, Burr, talk to me about how you've ended up in a field in County Offaly. Outstanding in my own field is the joke. But um, Burr, well, working in astronomy, you can't but help hear about Burr. Burr is famous in the same way that our great writers are famous internationally. When I went to NASA, there were people who knew all about Burr. You know, you're the Irish guy. Tell us about that big telescope that they have in, in Burr. What the hell is it? So they knew about it. If you go to Chile, down to the telescopes there, on the wall, there's a picture of the great Leviathan telescope from Burr County Offaly. So it was always there, and I, was, I'm, I'm, I love history. I spent a lot of time reading history, still do, and I began to understand the importance of Burr to global astronomy. The third Earl of Ross built an enormous telescope down there, which you can still go down and see, and he discovered that galaxies have spiral arms you know we didn't know that before he was the man who discovered spiral arms of galaxies it's a profound discovery and he said they're not just spirals but they're actually moving they must be they look like little whirlpools and i think he kind of got that idea from the river that runs through burr the camcor river he was looking at the little whirls of turbulence in the river and i think when he looked up into the sky then he went wow that looks like a whirlpool that i see in the river that goes past burr or through burr so You know, all of that was in my mind. And then I was looking for a place to put some antennas. So I'm back in Ireland, got very little money to do research. But I have enough money to buy some TV aerials and point them at the sun. And with those TV aerials, I'm going to try and study solar flares. Sounds crazy, but that's what we wanted to do. Well, we needed a nice radio quiet site. So I contacted Burr Castle and I said, I'm coming down. Any chance we can walk around and I'll tell you about the project and see what you think. And so I met. Uh, Brendan Parsons, who's the, the, the seventh Earl of Ross. And uh, we walked in through Burr. He showed me the Leviathan Telescope. And as we were walking down one of the roads, in a little dirt road in the castle, I saw a sheep shed. And I said, Who's, what's using that over there? And he said, oh, there's nothing. There's some sheep in there. And uh, so we walked up to the sheep shed and there was a yard outside. And I said, this is perfect for an antenna because we can block it off and the sheep can't get to it. We opened the door and in there are three sheep in the sheep shed. So that's where it started. Um, he said, put up your TV antenna. We started putting up our TV antenna. And over the past, I'm now working seven years in Burr since that first day. And those first days we were down there, you know, we had the umbrella out and were screwing things together in the rain in Burr when there was a load of boulders that needed to be mo- moved. We lifted all the boulders and threw them over the wall. And it's funny, with that strange antenna we made a discovery and that discovery was that there's these tiny little electrons flowing out of the sun at near the speed of light and we were able to pick them up with this tv antenna and uh, we were then able to combine that with nasa data and european space agency data to understand the process but the missing link was the tv aerial in burr and it's amazing. And that ended up being the front page of a journal called Nature Physics, which is the top journal for physics in the world. But it came from the sheep shed control room, as we joke about it now, in Burr. And that's that lovely edge of in a field in Burr and looking at the sun with NASA satellites all coming together in one story. What's your dream for the future? Well, five years ago, I started fundraising for an enormous radio telescope called LOFAR, the Low Frequency Array. And uh, I met Dermot Desmond at the top of the Irish Financial Service Centre. And he said, I don't really get your astronomy, 
But what I do get is you're training students to do amazing software with great skills that my companies need. So he gave us some money. And then he said, I know another guy called Dennis who might like to give you some money as well. So I got a phone call. I was having fish and chips in the ham cafe in Trinity on a Friday afternoon. And the phone went and I picked up the phone and somebody said, hello, it's Dennis. And I went, Dennis who? And I go, Dennis O'Brien. I hear you, you're trying to build a radio telescope in Burr Castle. And I said, yes, I'm just finishing my fish and chips here. Uh, I'll take the call anyway. So I told him all about the project. He said, that's great. And he wired through money t- to us, philanthropic donations to build these radio telescopes. So our first hundred grand came from Dermot Desmond and Dennis O'Brien. Then last year, we were just delighted that Science Foundation Ireland awarded us 1.4 million euros to build this radio telescope so we now have 2 million euros and then next spring 14 articulated trucks will come in from Holland with the the radio telescope parts and we'll build a radio telescope in Burke Castle and that will connect Ireland into this European network of radio telescopes that will look out at the sky. They're going to look at solar flares, the stuff I'm interested in. They're going to look at jets coming out of galaxies and out of black holes. They're going to try and look and find planets, other planets other than the planets in our solar system. They're called exoplanets. It's going to try and find them. It may even look for life on other planets. So back in Burr, you know, 150 years later, we now connect back into global astronomy and do something really exciting. And I'm going to have undergraduates and postgraduates from AIT, from Galway, from all universities building that thing. And imagine that, you build the radio telescope. And you can bring your kids there in 20 years' time, 30 years' time, say, I built that radio telescope and we discovered something like pulsars that Jocelyn Bell Burnell discovered um, in the 1960s in Cambridge. And Irish kids will do that. Peter Gallagher, solar physicist, proud dad, rock and roll guitarist, thank you so much for joining us here today in The Family of Things and for letting us understand just a little bit more about our world and the universe it sits within. Thank you.